As we're looking at the life of Saul today, Saul was an interesting individual. Now, there's two different Sauls, but the, the Saul that we are looking at today is the Saul that once he was converted became who? Paul, the Apostle Paul. It's hard to look at Saul and not see the hatred that he had in his heart. Looking at where he was, what he came from, and then what he became once he accepted the Lord. Let me read this before we go into our reading. Let me say this. Hatred is a dark, violent, selfish emotion, and it can destroy us. It can destroy the human heart. Now, hatred has a way of taking root, and it can take root like no other emotion. It can twist our thinking. Hatred can twist our actions until all that spews out of us is bitterness and resentment and anger. Now, it's hard to believe, but guess what? God wants to reach people just like that. God wants to reach people that, that has that hatred in their heart. And when you look at Paul and see how much he had inside him, you realize that God really was at work and God did a marvelous thing when that was removed. See, God gives us a great example here in the life of Saul of what happens when God touches the heart, a heart that is full of hate. It can be other things, bitterness, resentment, anger, and the list can go on and on. But I, know, I see no other example of anybody in the Bible where this is more real than right here in the life of the Apostle Paul. I've been studying his life. I've been studying his ministry. And there's things that have come out in my study that I've just never noticed before. Maybe it's something I missed. Maybe it's something I overlooked. Now, if I happen to miss it or overlook it, then perhaps there's things in his life that you too have missed and overlooked. I am marveled at this man, whom we've come to know and love as the Apostle Paul. Some people might refer to him as Saint Paul. I never call him just Paul. Very seldom do I ever do that. You know that story? You know why? I'm, I'm going to interrupt. I think some of you remember this. I was doing somebody's sermon, a uh, funeral, I don't even know, several years ago. And I was making reference to the Apostle Paul. I did not say Apostle Paul. I said Paul. The guy's name was something else. I don't remember who it was now, but it wasn't Paul. And a guy came up to me afterwards and said, you didn't even know that guy. You called him Paul three times. I wasn't talking about his name being Paul. I was talking about the Apostle Paul. So I realized that some people who aren't familiar with the Apostle Paul and not have a clear understanding of, of what I was trying to say, may not understand what I was saying. So most often I will refer to him as the Apostle Paul. I'm not talking about John or Harry or Jim and misnaming him by Paul. So most of what you'll hear me say I will refer to as the Apostle Paul. But I marveled at how he worked so hard and how he suffered for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now, before we get into our reading, I want to quote James. Many of you are familiar with this. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may become mature and complete. James is telling us here that God can take the bitter in our lives and make something sweet. And I see no greater example than what we see here in the life of the Apostle Paul. In the 8th chapter, we'll be in the ninth chapter in our reading, but in the 8th chapter, we find the Apostle Paul, who wasn't really called Paul at that time, he was Saul, but he was party 
to a murder. This Saul was a bright young Pharisee. He was trained by Gamaliel, which is a highly knowledgeable teacher of the word. But the murder victim that is being murdered here in the 8th chapter of Acts is a young man, a young disciple by the name of Stephen. Stephen is being stoned. While he's being stoned to death, what's his prayer? Lord, Nate, lay not to their charge this sin. Here he is dying at, at their hands, and he's praying, Lord, don't hold them accountable for this. Stephen becomes the first recorded martyr in the early church. And by martyr, I mean he's someone that died for his faith. He would not renounce his faith in God. He died and carried it out to the very end. Now Saul was a young man who comes from a very wealthy family. He has risen through the, the Jewish equivalent of any of our finest seminaries. Now actually we're going back to about 35 A.D. here. But may not be what, quite what we would have in our seminaries today. But still a very knowledgeable institution of learning. He was gifted with an incredible mind. Now this Saul could reason and debate better than anyone. He could skillfully defend what he believed in. He could skillfully defend his Jewish faith. No one wanted to debate this guy. Nobody wanted to argue with him. Why? Because he could rip you to shreds with his knowledge and with his logic and with his wit. He knew what he was talking about. He had it all up here. I didn't have it here, but he certainly had it up here. So now we see Saul arriving, I think, at a perfect place and a perfect time in history to be that chief defender of the Jewish faith. But what you also need to know is that Christians were first called Christians where? Antioch, okay? Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. And now, Jesus had already died. He had already ascended to the right hand of his heavenly Father. There was a big religious movement going on. There was a following of Christ, and people were, that, that group was growing and growing more because of the influence of these people. Now, there was a group called The Way. Now, I barely remember that. But in going through my studies, it came to me. Now, that group, it was a religious sect of people, and it really comes from Jesus' statement that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, here is Saul. He has one goal in mind, and that goal is what? To exterminate anybody, to annihilate them, to get rid of all of those that have launched onto this claim of new faith. Now, Saul, I don't believe that Saul was filled with fear by the faith that these people had. That didn't seem to bother them. I don't believe that he was filled with disgust or intolerance. What I see in Saul's life, he was filled with hate in his heart. He hated Christians. He hated who Jesus Christ was. I'll say more about that in a minute. Now, see, Paul was a Pharisee, and he was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was a role model, and we talked about role models today with the youth. But he was a role model of the purely legalistic, autocratic, judgmental, and antiquated religious system. What Jesus came to change and what Jesus came to replace with the new covenant. And that was a covenant of love. Now Saul was an individual that was filled with self-righteousness. And since he fully believed that he was as perfect as a man could be living under the Mosaic law. He was full-blown self-righteous. 
and because of his self-righteousness and because of his knowledge and use of the law, nobody really wanted to fool with this guy. Nobody was brave enough to tackle him. He's elevated now to the high standing with the members of the Sanhedrin. Somebody asked, what's the Sanhedrin? I guess if I could put it in as close to layman's terms as I can, it would be that Jewish high theological court. They knew the word. They knew the Torah anyway. Now, his all-intensive purpose was to annihilate the people. And he was the right man for the job because he certainly didn't like Christians. His job was to wipe out all the followers of that Nazarene, that Nazarene who claims to be the Christ, the Messiah. Now, his mindset and his purpose was to set out, go across the countryside, seeking to imprison, to destroy, and to kill anyone who claimed to be a follower of Jesus, who is the Christ. So let's try to get into the mindset of where Paul was, Saul was. Saul was an individual. He hated Jesus. In fact, he saw Jesus as being a blasphemer and saw him as being a false prophet. Now, some would say that with his A-type personality, he seeks to wipe out this movement that is growing, growing against his own wishes, growing to the extreme end of what he stood for. It was an obsession. And, and, and I noticed over here in the 8th chapter, and I did not read this in the early service, but I think I got enough time to do that. We see where Saul ravages the church. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now just to add to his hatred toward Christians, we see in the 26th chapter of the same book, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things. But this time he's already had the conversion experience. I was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only looked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme and in raging fury against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Now when I think about that and I read other passages similar to that, I'm convinced that if he had had a bomb strapped on him, he would be willing to go into any group of Christians and people identifying themselves as Christian and detonate the bomb and kill himself just to be able to annihilate all those Christians. So whether we think about it in these terms, I'm not sure. But Saul was the first terrorist against followers of Jesus Christ. Now this is the kind of hate that fueled this man. This is the kind of hate that, that motivated him. This is the kind of hate that was held captive in his heart. And in the deep crevices of his heart, there was nothing there but hate for the followers of Jesus. Okay, now let's step back a minute. What, what happened? I mean, how, how is it that Saul, the persecuted of the church, become now the Paul the persecuted for Jesus Christ. It all happened suddenly. It all happened in that Damascus Road experience. Try to get this image, try to get this picture of the Damascus Road. 
I, I picture Saul being there, trying to annihilate, trying to kill all of these Christians. And he's got the arrest warrants right there in his hands. Ready to take hold of the best known leaders of the way. And he was accompanied by the best thugs that money could buy. And then we see in the ninth chapter of Acts, starting with verse 3. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are out persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Paul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he wasn't able to see anything. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Here's where Saul's faith became real for probably the first time in his life. He had that Damascus Road experience. Now, now let's try to put ourselves in, in his shoes. Here was a man that was so filled with hate that he could not stand any followers of Christ and anything that Christ stood for. But here, Saul meets the God that he has studied about so much in his study. And the, the subject expert, and he had become the subject expert on God, meets the very subject that he has studied. And now we find him driven to his knees, and driven so in humility and in reverence. But here is where the metamorphosis, metamorphosis begins. The one who was blinded by hate has a complete change, and he is now blinded by love. The pure, the holy, the perfect, the eternal transforming love of Jesus Christ has now entered Saul's sight. Where there was once hate, hate beyond anything I think any of us can begin to imagine, is now engulfed with this illuminating power of Jesus Christ in his own heart. And that light that, that light that blinded him on the Damascus Road entered his eyesight. He was blind, but it just didn't stop there. See, it entered from his eyes and made its way into his heart. And something was different. Now, Scripture tells us for three days and nights, Saul was blinded. And, and here is that religious intellect. What's going on in three days? You take my sight away from me, and I'm going to be doing a lot of thinking. You're going to be doing a lot of thinking. He still had his mind, and God was speaking to them. He was dumbfounded as he comes to the realization that Jesus Christ really is Lord. And Jesus had spoken to him there on the Damascus Road. So for three days... What was he doing? He was spending time thinking. He was spending time in prayer with God. God has a way of getting our attention. God had a way of getting Saul's attention by striking him blind for three days. Then you'll read on a little later on in that chapter that God speaks to a particular church leader by the name of Ananias. And here is this enemy of the church, Saul, who has now had this experience and he goes from being enemy of the church to being an evangelist to the Gentiles. Now, Scripture tells us right here in this same chapter that Ananias lays his hands on Saul 
as God had instructed him to do. And what happened? His sight was restored. It goes on to say in that same passage that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And scale-like items fell from his eyes. See, he was blinded. He was blinded by that hate. He wanted nothing to do with anything that had anything to do with Christ. And we see that he was baptized. Now what happened? He has this experience. He goes from hating Christians to doing everything he can to annihilate them to now preaching the word. Preaching that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. A complete turnaround. A 180 degree turn. Now he becomes Paul there at Antioch. And he and Barnabas link up and become partners in ministry for two years. Now think about the Apostle Paul. The change that had taken place in his life. And he goes to speak to thousands and to tens of thousands of people that are hungry for the word. But it's not all easy. Through this, he's beaten. He is scourged, he's imprisoned, he's stoned and left for dead, he's shipwrecked, and then, before it all ended, his head was cut off by a sword. You know, I'm not too sure if you started beating me because I'm preaching the word, how steadfast I would remain. And then if you started scourging me and imprisoning me and stoning me I might be tempted to back off just a little but not Paul he continued with the word now the light of heaven fell upon him like a lightning bolt that day and that hate that had controlled him was no longer controlling him all of that hate had been swapped out for love and wanting people to know and understand the love of Jesus Christ and the salvation that he can give. Now, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, do you believe, do you think that the God that spoke to Saul on the Damascus Road is the same God that speaks to us today? I see a few people saying, yes, he is. And the same message that God had then is the same message for us. And I believe that we can still find the Lord on the Damascus Road speaking to those that hate him. How many people do you work with that want to have absolutely nothing to do with God? How many people do you have an encounter with, people that you know that absolutely want to have nothing to do with Christians? What's it going to do, what's it going to take to turn them from that bitterness in their heart to realizing the love and the understanding, the power that we can have through Christ Jesus in our lives? See, maybe what we need to do is to have the power of God to remove those scales off of our lives, off of our eyes, the people that we work with. Some people would say it would take a Damascus Road experience to change them. Maybe, and God can do that. But God could also work in us and through us to be the witness that we need to be. So how effective are we out there? Where are we in turning people from the bitterness and the hate that we have for the church, for God, to causing them to realize that they can have life. They can have life everlasting. They can have life with peace. People are longing for that. The very thing that Saul stood for was removed. And he became just as passionate 
for God as he was against God. But it took a changed heart. Can God use your life? Sure he can. But he can't use it with that bitterness and hate and resentment. We've got to give it to God. And for Saul, it took a Damascus Road experience. I pray that it would take a humble heart in saying, okay, God, here I am. Here's all those things, all those impurities that I do not like and it does not glorify you. Clean it up. Make my life useful for you. Shall we pray?